Welcome back to Art and Artifact. I'm Pastor Carol Clark. Art and Artifact is one of my class series at Faith Lutheran Church, and it's being posted now in video recordings to encourage you in your study of the word. Each topic is shared in three video sessions on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday every week. Since this is Tuesday, this is session two of three for this week. If you've not yet viewed yesterday's session, you'll benefit from watching it before continuing with today's session. Let's begin with prayer. Lord God, I ask that each person watching today would be strengthened in faith. Give us joy in the sure and certain knowledge that Christ conquers all our sin through no work of our own. We acknowledge that we receive faith, salvation, and forgiveness as a gracious gift from you, a gift we do nothing to deserve. We pray this in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Here we are in a mausoleum in the northern Italian town of Ravenna. This mausoleum was created around the year 425 for a woman named Gala Placidia. It's famous for the wonderful mosaics on the walls of the interior of the mausoleum. I'm going to show you a close-up of the imagery over the head of the leaning man in the blue shirt. Let's talk about what you see here. First, you might notice the rectangular structure in the center of the imagery. It's a window. To the right of the window is a figure clad in white. His name is St. Lawrence. He was martyred in the period when Christianity was still illegal. The Romans executed him by roasting Lawrence over an open fire. In the center of the photo, under the window, you see the instrument of his death. The Romans called it an iron bed. It was the grill to which Lawrence was strapped for his slow roasting and excruciating death. He holds the cross of Christ for whom he died and a book of Holy Scripture. Note that the scriptures are in a codex form, not a scroll. The codex form of the book becomes popular as the first copies of the New Testament books begin to circulate. It's a much more practical and manageable way to read. Finding a passage in the middle of a book is so quick. No more of that tedious roll, roll, rolling you have to do with a scroll. In fact, the codex is such a great invention that it gradually replaces the scroll, and by the fourth century, the scroll is largely extinct. It's the distribution of the Christian scriptures that leads the way on this. I'm going to come back to this image in a minute, but first we need to learn another term. Parchment. This is a writing material made of a flat, thin, prepared animal skin, usually a sheep or goat. Sometimes you'll also hear the term vellum. That was an especially thin kind of parchment, usually made of calf skin. Although an early codex would have pages made of papyrus, the material of choice soon became parchment. As the scriptures are shared in Europe, papyrus becomes less popular. This is mainly because papyrus is a fragile material, while parchment is extremely durable. And papyrus grows only in a limited region, particularly Egypt. Think about what it takes to create a parchment codex. Many sheep or goats would need to be slaughtered and skinned, then the skins would need to be prepared and cut into pages. This made a book in parchment very valuable. For holy scriptures, it was worth it. So let's go back now to our image of the mosaic decoration in the mausoleum of Gala Placidia. Because a codex was a valuable object, it would have been encased in a heavy cover. The cover was often made of wooden boards covered with leather. This would help keep the parchment sheets flat 
and also protect them. Some manuscripts had covers decorated with gold and jewels too. In addition to being very durable, parchment pages are also thick and heavy. So often only one book of the Bible could be bound in a single codex. Take a look now at the left side of the image. There is a bookcase with four parchment codices on the shelves. Let me take you in for a closer look. Here we have the four Gospels, each manuscript bound separately in codex form. The Greek names for the Gospel writers are noted on the covers of the books, Matthäus, Marcus, Lucas, and Johannes. These books were luxurious and holy objects, worthy of a special container or bookcase for their protection. Also note that the early custom is to store them laying down. This is the Codex Vaticanus, which dates to around the year 325. As implied in the title, it's in the Vatican Library. This is an early parchment codex in great condition. Written in Greek, it contains the Old Testament plus most of the New Testament. The page enlarged here is page 1512. The number is in the upper left hand corner. On this page is the end of 2 Thessalonians and the beginning of Hebrews. The green bar shows the division between the books. All books throughout human history until the 15th century were copied by hand. The printing press was not invented until the 1440s. This means that every ancient manuscript was a unique handmade copy. In late antiquity and the early Middle Ages, most Bible production happened in monasteries. Imagine the monks hunched over their desks, assiduously copying the sacred texts. Monasteries had designated places for this kind of work. The room where the scribes worked was called a scriptorium. Sometimes a monk sat at a desk copying from another book, as you see in this medieval illustration. Other times, a room full of scribes wrote out the text as a reader recited the text aloud. Extensive analysis and comparison of the many surviving early texts shows an astounding constancy. Looking at the old papyrus and parchment books, we see most often word for word exact reproduction of text. The scribes who copy these works see in them the word of God, the truths of life. It's a rare scribe who fools with that. When there is a discrepancy, it's usually a word or a line that's different. Often these are easily explained. Uh, omission of a single line in a manuscript could simply mean that the copyist lost track of the lines and skipped one. Occasionally there are words that sound alike but are spelled differently, homonyms, and the wrong one has incorrectly been inserted. Sometimes a proofreader, yes, they had those too, would note that a scribe left out a word or heaven forbid skipped a line. In that case, the omitted bit would be inserted in the margin with an indication of where it should have been. Sometimes a pointed finger or other embellishment indicated the proper placement. In the instances of omissions or large discrepancies, it's often possible to analyze which text is true to the original. And this is because we do have multiple copies of works from the first few centuries so that comparisons between them contribute to the analysis. In the early Middle Ages, the Christian monasteries of Europe were the great preservers of knowledge and faith in written form. Europe had fallen into a dark age, and these monasteries were bright lights of learning and faith in a time when such knowledge was in danger of being extinguished. In addition to the scriptoria, monasteries also housed some of the great libraries of the medieval period. Books are often chained to the furniture as a security measure. Today we use different technologies in our libraries to keep track of the collection and prevent theft, 
but the purpose is the same here. This is a page from one of the manuscripts of the early Middle Ages, the Book of Kells, which was created in the 800s. It was, of course, hand copied by monastic scribes and hand illustrated. The Book of Kells contains the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in Latin. It's decorated with numerous colorful decorations. Now remember the making of a book like this one began with the killing of a bunch of animals. The skins of 185 calves make up the pages of the Book of Kells. Scraped, dried, and stretched, these calf skins then were folded and cut to create the pages of the book and sewn together. The colorful painted decorations are called illuminations. So a book like this one, handmade with colorful adornment, is called an illuminated manuscript. The Book of Kells was created in a monastery on an island called Iona, part of Scotland today. Imagine the monks inside their stone huts, battered by sea winds with squawking gulls outside, bent over their painstaking work. The monks on the isolated island of Iona also faced a threat from the outside. Do you know what it was? The monastery at Iona, like many early Christian communities, came under the threat of Viking raids. In 806, following a raid that left 68 of the community dead, the monks fled their Scottish island, seeking refuge in Ireland, taking this illuminated manuscript with them. It's still in Ireland, on display in the Trinity College Library in Dublin. The production of Bibles and other Christian books in the monasteries was meant to spread the word of Christianity and to enrich worship. A copy of the Gospels that was this heavily embellished was destined to be a showpiece on an altar. The precious word of God is contained in these pages treating these pages with the utmost honor, using elegant materials, devoting much time to their production. All these things reflect the esteem for the Holy Scriptures in the life of Christian faith. These great decorations in the Book of Kells are indeed spectacular. But I don't want you to think the Book of Kells is unique. There were other gospel books produced in the same time period and geographic area that have similar qualities. So we have a broad idea now about the copying of the Holy Scriptures during the early Middle Ages. But in the late Middle Ages, things started to change. In fact, mass production of Bibles and other books began even before there was a printing press. By the 1100s, books were no longer just being copied in the monasteries. In addition to book production in the monasteries, there were shops that turned out copies of the Bible and other popular books. The Bible was always the most common manuscript being produced. In the later Middle Ages, there were now more customers for books. Not just monks, priests, and others in the church were literate. People in high positions in government and their clerks were literate now. The nobility were educated as were some of the merchant classes. Plus, universities had been established in some European cities like Paris and Oxford. Christian theology remains at the core of the curriculum in these new universities, but mathematics, music, rhetoric, and medicine are also taught. Most literate households had at least one book in this period, and even if they had only one book, it would be the Bible. To satisfy the growing demand for books, a new industry begins to appear. Scribes and bookbinders open shops to sell their services to the public. Soon, booksellers and bookmakers are springing up in all the major towns. As a result, books, particularly Bibles, become more common than they've ever been before. As more of them become available, more people have the opportunity to learn to read. And as more of the population becomes literate, the demand for Bibles and other books increases. 
More and more educated people are wanting books of all kinds, but as I said, the main book that everyone wants to own is the Bible. So the church is not the only place that Bibles are being produced now. In the late Middle Ages, things are changing. The image of a monk hunkered over a desk, painstakingly reproducing a manuscript fits the early part of the Middle Ages, but by the 1200s, the scene changes. Imagine bookshops with merchants who provided this bookmaking service. Remember, there is no printing press yet, so all the books are still created one at a time by hand. Not just anyone could set up a shop as a scribe copying books. A period of training and apprenticeship was required. This was true for other trades as well. Weavers, bakers, blacksmiths, jewelers, painters, and other craftsmen went through a process of apprenticeship too. A group of skilled craftsmen in the same trade would be part of a guild. Membership in a guild was an honor as it was a sign you were a skilled worker who had some respect in society. You started out as an apprentice and that usually lasted about seven years. In the case of book copyists, the scribes were trained to do beautiful calligraphy and paint illustrations for the books. During the final year of apprenticeship, much time would be spent creating an ideal sample or piece of work that the apprentice would submit to the guild for approval. If the sample piece was judged to be acceptable, the apprentice would become a master and could open his own shop as a scribe. The sample piece of work became known as a master piece as a result. Today we associate that word with a great work of art, but in the Middle Ages, a masterpiece was the best work of an apprentice submitted to become a master. Of course, the scribe was just one person involved in the production of a medieval Bible. Parchmenters were needed to create the parchment pages. Bookbinders would sew the pages together and make beautiful leather covers. Scribes were not only men. Just as in the previous centuries when Bible production happened in monasteries, both men and women did the work. Previously, it was monks and nuns. Now it might be a husband and wife team setting up a shop for bookmaking. Often it became a family business as sons and daughters were trained in the trade. A new innovation in Bibles is beginning in this period too. That's where we'll begin tomorrow.